Hey, you guys look awesome in that pavilion. Give yourselves a round of applause. Come on. That's what I'm talking about. We're so glad that you are here. My name is Jeremy. I'm the lead pastor at Why Not Family Church, and I just want to give a big thank you to our amazing team behind the scenes that work hard to make this day happen. Can we give them a round of applause as well, everyone who worked hard to set up? And uh, now, we, we typically meet on 12th and North Line, or Ford Avenue, right across from 7-Eleven. We would love for you to join us. If you're a guest, we're glad that you joined us today. We'd love for you to join us next week as we continue our story series. All the month of July, we have different people share their stories. And next week, we have some of our very own uh, being interviewed and sharing their stories. It's going to be a great Sunday. We're so glad that you're here. I want to take a moment and ask for um, Matthew and Crystal Lawrence and John Oates if they can make their way to the stage. If they could kind of come up here. This past week, we had the Wyandotte Street Art Fair. And... It was a great week. We had a double booth set up, but we had tents and we had an inflatable, and we were able to connect with hundreds and hundreds of people. Matter of fact, we had around 39 different individuals serve um, throughout the week, and, um, and I just want to personally uh, thank a couple people because it was, um, this past week we got to pray with people every single day. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Right there at the tent. Right there, by the game, right there with poor dogs and elephant ears, we got to pray for people. And, um, and people sensed God's presence when they were around our booth. People were encouraged. And, um, and we have different people other than um, just me. I saw there was a few others that were praying for others. And that was the goal of the street fairs. We wanted everyone to practice having conversations, practice listening and practicing offering prayer. Because that's something you can do anywhere you go. Amen? Amen. 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 So we wanted, that was the whole goal of the street fair. And I want to thank my wife and my family, my kids. They did an amazing job filling in all the gaps um, and, and serving and doing it. I want to thank also my mom and my dad, Joe and Rose Gorky. They filled in many, many different gaps of time slots as well. Um, our goal next year is going to be 60, at least 60 individuals from Why Not Family signing up for one time slot. So I'm casting the goal now for 2022, a minimum of 60. I know we can do it, but, but this right here, come on up here to the, to the front. This is, uh, was our street fair team, and we met, started meeting, was it in February? In February, we had our first meeting to plan the street fair. And uh, this past week, we connected with, literally, um, I mean, we had 600 people at least stop by our booth and filled out um, the, the entry forms that we interacted with hundreds more, probably over a thousand people uh, easily. Um, we were able to encourage kids to see kids smile, pray with people. And that's all because of you guys and your dedication, um, your commitment. And your willingness to say yes, Lord. And so we just simply got a little thank you for you. And hopefully this is a blessing. We appreciate you guys so much. And, uh, and, and you'll, you'll enjoy that together. And can we just give them a round of applause and thank you for making the street fair happen. Um, it, it takes a team to do, to do anything of significance. And they were a great team. They were a lot of fun. They always had great attitudes. And they always smiled. Absolutely, yes. So we love you, we appreciate you, and just thank you so much for, for being a part of the team. All right, now, before you guys leave, if you can grab that bag right there, that, that bag, we're going to draw the winner for the Nintendo Switch. Um, at the street fair, people signed up to, um, to enter a giveaway. And, and, and just mix it, I'm gonna mix it all up. There are probably about 600 different entry forms and we are mixing it all up and we're gonna pull one lucky winner live in front of you so you guys know it's legit. Right? There's no shenanigans here, okay? And I'm going into the middle of the pile and we have right here, woo! Let's see who it is. This is Adam Hossey from Rockwood, uh, Michigan, is the winner, and he said he wants information about Wyandotte Family Church. Right? Yeah, come on. So we're going to call him on Monday, and he's going to be surprised.
right, so congratulations, Adam, for being the winner of Nintendo Switch. Well, you guys are in for a treat because we have a special guest here to share his story uh, and his journey of forgiveness. It is Kevin Ransby is a, is a friend of mine um, throughout the years. He, he's been a pastor in Highland Park. He's been a pastor in Detroit. And um, he just has amazing testimony. Kevin, you can come on up here. And uh, is he back there? There he is. All right. I'm like, maybe he went home. I don't know. He's like, he went over to 7-Eleven. But, uh, and he has had to walk a journey of forgiveness. And I don't want to take a story. But if you struggle with forgiveness or you have something that you've been wrestling with, you want to make sure you really tune in this morning. So please welcome Pastor Kevin Ransby. How many love your pastors today? I said it. How many love your pastors today? <laughs> Amazing pastors, just been dear friends to us, and just such a encourager. I was sharing with someone before service that, and Pastor Jeremy is just the real deal. He is just genuine, authentic, and man, he is just the right man for the job. Amen. So you guys continue supporting him, encouraging him, lifting him up, right? Amen. All right. Well, let me just kind of share from um, my wife and I. We've been. Uh, pastors in the inner city of Detroit for the last 24 years until the Lord's kind of begin shifting us into a new season. But there's a quote um, by um, this famous Holocaust survivor. Her name is Corey Tenboon. It says this, there's only a handful of decisions that a person actually makes in life. And the rest of our life is spent managing those decisions. How many know that's true, right? Like you make a decision to marry someone, and then the rest of your life is spent managing that decision. If you're married in one of those things, say amen. Yes, we all done it. So for me, let me just kind of launch on. There's two little stories. That I, I believe there's two, two of my handful of decisions I've ever made in life. One of them was years ago. And um, I came to Detroit to work with uh, young people who are especially caught up in gangs in southwest Detroit, lived down there for many years. And uh, one day I was praying for this gang that would stand on our corners. They had a house right across the street from our church, and I began praying for them. And one day in praying, there was a man, uh, there was a guy in the gang, he was the second leading gang member. And I felt like the Lord, the Holy Spirit just kind of gave me a word, which, again, I'm not one of those guys that gets words often, but I knew this was different. And this is what I was praying for him. I, I heard this. It was this. It said if you, that you need to go tell, his name was Joey. I think he had a tougher gang name than Joey, but I knew his name, real name was Joey. He was probably like Tiger or, I don't know, or Vampire. I don't know. He had a tough name, I'm sure. Or Diesel. Um, but uh, I remember praying for him, and this is what the Lord sh showed me told me. He said, you need to go tell Joey that if he doesn't give his heart to the Lord, get out of the gang, and move out of the city, he'll be dead within a few months. And when I heard those words, and that was, it was just like, I've never had that happen before in that manner. I mean, I was like, okay. And now I was scared, because how am I going to go tell a complete stranger who is in this gang that message, and I've never talked to him in my life before. So sure enough, the next day I saw him driving by, and the, the, what I felt like I was supposed to go say him came to my mind again, and I just chickened out. I was like, no way, I can't do it. I'm like, no way, I cannot do it. This is not going to go well. And so I totally blew it off and just kind of reasoned it off of like, you know, I just, I'm not sure. And a couple days passed by, and then once again, um, I, I saw him. And man, I just fear kept coming over me, but those words that if you don't go tell him and share the gospel, to tell him about Jesus, and if he doesn't surrender his life to him, and if he doesn't get out of the gang, and if he doesn't move out of the city, he's going to die. And now he's going to face eternity from then on. And so I began praying for him and saw him again. And once again, I totally chickened out. <laughs> and... Um, Finally, I felt like God was just wrestling with me, and in that moment, I began praying, and I said, all right, next time I see him, God, I promise you, I will do, be obedient, and I'll go tell him that. And sure enough, um, another day, couple days passed, and I see him driving down in a car, and it was like classic gangster movie, 
like rims spinning, tinted windows, an old Impala or whatever it was, and it was like one of those rides. And um, it was there that I saw him, and God said, you told me next time you saw him, you would do it. And I was like, oh, no, I can't do this. And so sure enough, he's driving. My only, my only kind of calm was like, maybe he'll just keep driving, and I can just see him go and say, you know, maybe next time. Uh, but sure enough, he pulled over right next to church into the liquor store parking lot. And all of a sudden, I was like, okay, I've got to do this. And so in that moment, what I ended up doing is I walked over to the car. All the windows are up, but I knew he was in there. I walked up and I tapped on the window. <laughs> and they rolled down their window. And as they did, it was like this old movie where all the smoke just came out. And I got high. I mean, I wasn't high on Jesus, but it was like, poof. They were all in there smoking. <laughs> and they rolled down the windows. I said, is Joey in there? And he said, they said, they're all looking around like, I don't know if I need to do something with the feedback here. Uh, but he was uh, totally in there, and they, they get him. He comes out of the car. I introduced myself to him, and I said, hey, can I talk to you? Um, I've just been praying for you. There's something that I feel like I'm supposed to say to you, tell you. Um, he agrees to meet me the next day in um, a certain restaurant, which is in his territory, so that he would be protected, make sure it was no setup or sting or anything like that. It was a little taco dive in southwest Detroit. And uh, we go in there together. We order our food. We sit down, and now I'm standing across the table with this guy, and I'm scared. And so all I could do was just woof down all my tacos, and I look up, and I don't even think he had started his tacos, and now I have an empty plate, and now I'm like, well, now i got to talk. This is not going to go good. And so finally I just was honest with him. I said, hey, Joey, I've been praying for you. I know you don't know me, but I know your sisters, your younger sisters that come to our kids' church, but I felt like God wanted me to tell you this, that, that he, if you don't surrender your life to him, he loves you, and you don't surrender your life to the Lord, and you don't leave this lifestyle, this gang, and you don't get out of this city, you will be dead within a couple of months. And as soon as I said those last words, I mean, I looked down, closed my eyes, because I didn't want to look at his response, but his, but his phone went off. And on the phone, there was a number that came across the screen, the screen and he looks up at me and goes, man, let me just, this is weird. And he, he didn't say weird, he said another word. But um, the number that came across the phone was this, 666187. And he goes, do you know what that means? And I'm like, I know what 666 means. I'm like, devil, Satan, Lucifer, whatever. And uh, he goes, 187 is obviously, it's if for a police radio call, it's a call in for murder. And so when I said that and I shared what God wanted me to tell him, somehow some random number comes across his phone that says 666187. For him, it's like God spoke directly to him saying, if, like murder, he's going to be murdered. <laughs> and the next day he showed up to church, gives his heart to the Lord. A couple weeks later he moved, gets out of the gang, moves out of the city. And just a couple years ago I reconnected with him. He went through a teen challenge program in, in Texas. And man, he's on fire for Jesus. <laughs> decisions I've made once, and then the rest of my life I managed it. For me, that handful of decisions was just whenever I feel one of those inner kind of like promptings, obey it, follow it. That it may be the Lord actually wanting to use me in, in a certain way. And so instead of being fearful and um, rationalized but and saying like, how can I do this? I'm not good enough or I can never do that. It was one of those moments I made it once and now the rest of my life I've now followed Every time those, those little promptings come up, I've made a commitment to say, I'm going to follow them. But the second one that I've made, a handful of decisions that I've, had to, I've made in my life and then the rest of my life has been managing and was made in a hospital room. And it's now, it's been 12 years ago. But it was in a hospital room after a man had broke into my home at 3 in the morning. And as he broke into my home, he climbed through a window armed with a, a large kitchen knife. Um, and a screwdriver. As he's crawling his way into the home, I was upstairs sleeping at 3 in the morning. I raced down, and we collided at the end of my steps. 
um, running full speed at each other. As I launched the tackle, the guy it was he had just a split second to lower the knife, and the first stab went to my abdomen, and life just kind of stopped for a split second with his knife inside of me, me looking at his eyes, and we began fighting in the in my home. We fought for just a, a few minutes or so. I don't even know if it was a minute, two minutes, to the point where he was just stabbing me over and over again. I was just trying to block his knives. Fell on the ground. Man jumped on top of me, straddled me, just began stabbing me over and over again, all the way through the cheek, two times to the throat, to the chest. The whole chest was a bruise, to the temple. And, man, it was just an awful night. Um, the guy just wanted to know where my keys and money were. He was high on crack. He was just looking for drug money. Um, I had never met him before. Upon going into my kitchen, he couldn't find my keys, so he would come back, stab me, go back again, look. To the point he ends up dragging me to my kitchen floor. <coughs> Wanted to know where the keys of money for the last time. Looked up at him and just said, it doesn't matter anymore because I'm dead. I knew I had been stabbed and wounded. I couldn't move. I felt I was paralyzed. I couldn't move because of the six stabs to the back of my neck and the spine area. I felt like I was literally stuck to the ground. That's why he was just dragging me. And upon that moment, when I told him it doesn't matter anymore, I'm dead, um, I closed my eyes. He began to go upstairs, go through all my home. But in those minutes, I began to pray. Isn't that kind of what we do? How many, when life gets out of control, no one's there to help you, and you have nowhere to turn, how many know that's when we start to really pray, right? I've learned that, man, if I can learn to pray when things are going good, it'll even be a better life than just when it's always in a crisis. But nevertheless, in that crisis moment, as I'm laying on my kitchen floor, um, literally dying, I began praying. I began praying and asking God just to let me know that He knows what I'm going through. Have you ever been there in life where you've just said, God, do you see me? Do you know what I'm going through tonight? Do you know what I'm going through in this moment? And for me, that was the number one question. I didn't care about being rescued. I didn't care about healed, being healed. I didn't even care about living in that moment. All I wanted to know was that God knew what I was going through. And as I closed my eyes and I began praying that prayer, I waited for God to, to give me a sign and to give me some type of a, an answer that he saw me. And now what was my darkest moment in life, and I just had never faced before, would have never have dreamt that the dreams that I went to bed with that night intact for my life and for my family was all of a sudden going to be shattered because of the actions of this man. I just remember closing my eyes and waiting for God to answer. And in that silence, as I waited anticipated, it was as if, God was just nowhere around. I felt, I literally felt God had abandoned me. I prayed my final prayers. I began praying for my wife. I prayed for my son. I mean, I prayed for my daughter. I began praying for my son. That my son wouldn't blame God for what happened to his dad. Because how many know that's what we do oftentimes when bad things happen in life? A lot of times we begin to blame God, don't we? And we're like, God, if you're a loving God, how can you allow this? God, if you were there, if you're good, how could you cause this to happen? And we begin to assign this blame to God. And so I began praying that my son would never blame God for what happened to his dad. And as I was closing my eyes and waiting and praying those prayers, it was I heard these four words, they, they, they were, they still need you. But when I heard that and realized that someone needed me, it was a game changer. Can I tell you why not, Family Church? People need you today. Yes. Your church needs you. Yes. Your family members, your sons or your spouse, they need you. Your parents, they need you. Your schoolmates, they need you. The guys you play basketball down at the park or skateboard with, they need you. Your friends. There are people who need you, and this is what they're gonna what's gonna happen. Life is going to come and blindside you. It's going to knock you down. It's going to surprise you. You're going to feel overwhelmed. You may even feel like God has abandoned you. And what you do in those moments will determine what kind of person you will become for those who need you and are going to be looking and watching you navigate through this storm in life. And unfortunately, we are living in a world where we don't see too many people navigate those storms. And what we do now is... We blame, we cancel, we fight, we argue, we debate, and we do everything else but then walk through the storms of life 
and walk through them in a way that God will be with us. And so for me, it was in that moment that I prayed and I heard those those words, they still need you, I, I began to fight to live again. Instead of just laying on the ground and accepting that bad things happened to me and my life was over and it would never be the same, I began to fight for tomorrow. I began to fight for the people that I wouldn't know who, would, who needed me and that I would later find out in the stories the years past. But I began fighting. It was there that I realized how bad I was stabbed and how bad I was hurting as I began to stand up. I realized how bad it was. My insides were on the outside of me, and so I had to pick them up and carry them out of the side door of my house while the attacker was still upstairs. Made it to my neighbor's porch where he was able to call the paramedics. And there was no greater feeling in the world than waking up in a hospital room a week later and to realize I'm still here. And for whatever reason, I've survived and I'm here and that there's hope for something that can get better in my life. But as I laid in that hospital room, those words they still needed, they came back to me and, I, and again, it was when I made the first time I made the choice in my life that I now had to spend the next, the last 12 years managing. And that was to forgive the guy, but not to stab me 37 times. Because the reality is this, there's, when someone wrongs you and hurts you, there's the person and then there's the action, what they did. But how many know that sometimes that can be the easiest part to forgive, the guy that I can forgive that he stabbed me 37 times. But what was more difficult that I would begin to realize that the battle to forgive, the fight to forgive was going to be, how do I keep forgiving him with the impact that now his actions has had on my life, what they produce? So many times over the last 12 years, I've been tempted to go back to that night, to go back to that person that did this to me, to go back to that his offense and pick it up again in a sense to become bitter, not because he stabbed me, but because you know what? He stole the innocence of my kids. Because he caused me to lose everything financially and for bankruptcy. I had to move four times in five years and the frustration of what that had to do, the shame that I had to walk in every time. Even when I had to renew my credentials for ministry, it became an issue because I was a minister who had to file bankruptcy because I almost died. Well, that on the surface, it looks like you don't know how to keep and manage your funds and your money. And so I had to explain, but the shame would come in. It took me two and a half years to tell anyone that I went bankrupt, that I lost everything, because I was so full of the shame because of this. And so there was all of these incidences that I would, at times, I would come across when the man was finally in jail and we began corresponding. I'll talk a little bit more about this. When he began to say, you know, if you really forgave me, you would help me get out of prison now. And for me, I'm sitting here going, what? And I would have to, at that moment, choose to forgive again, or I would have to choose to go back and pick up that offense again and begin walking in that unforgiveness and, and bitterness or whatever. There's so many times I've encountered this. And so, as you can see, my life, it wasn't just a one-time decision but forgiveness for me over the last 12 years, I can tell you I probably had to forgive this guy probably well over 100 or 200 times. Maybe you know what it's like to have someone hurt you, wrong you, betray, lie, cheat, steal. Maybe some of you experienced some trauma in your life where there's been abuse, whether it's verbal, whether it's sexual, or whatever it might be that you've had abuse in your life and you've, you've experienced that pain. There's going to be always this temptation to pick it up once again after you say, I forgive. And, and I've had to work this. So life has been spent managing these last 12, last 12 years of how to keep forgiving. So what I want to do with you kind of today in closing is I want to take you back to Genesis 37. Joseph, to me, in scriptures, has become my travel companion. He's been kind of a hero in the faith to me. Because Joseph was a man who was not just wronged by his brothers who were jealous and envious of the relationship he had with their father and that they lacked that kind of relationship. They were jealous of him and they, were, they became bitter at him when he began to boast about these dreams God had gave him. So they, they came up with this plan to betray their brother and to throw him into a pit. 
And they were just basically going to leave him to die and they, because they were just, they, they hated his, they were hated, they hated his brother Joseph. They ended up selling him, you know the story if you're familiar with it, they ended up, instead of leaving him there to die, they ended up selling him into slavery. He's now taken to Egypt and now he's, he's serving there where he becomes, now he's falsely accused in Potiphar's house and, and he's falsely accused by the wife who said that he tried to take advance of advantage of her and came on to her and which he didn't he withstood all those times but nevertheless because he was trying to do the right thing he's falsely accused which then leads him thrown into prison and in prison he's now going to spend years of his life just in a dark space in a very troubled time in a like he's stuck he can't go anywhere some of you know that feeling of what it means to be stuck in life where you know that there's something good out there, but for whatever reason you feel like I'm confined and imprisoned and I can't get to what God might have for me because I'm stuck. Well, Joseph was stuck. And so it comes through this time and years have passed that God showed his faithfulness to Joseph and God uses him, the gifts that God gave him, and he starts serving other prisoners in, the, in there. And he one day comes across the, this baker and this cup and, and here what happens is he begins to use his dreams and he interprets those dreams, which leads him to one day being released from prison. And upon being released and he begins to, to use his gifts, he's promoted to now the second leading person that's right under the Pharaoh. He's the second one in charge of all of Egypt. He now goes from literally the prison to the palace. He's that much in charge. And a famine had came over the land. So now all of the world is going to be coming to Joseph's door to help. And, to, and he's going to help resource them and meet people. And everyone's lives are going to be dependent upon this man who was wronged and betrayed and hurt and wounded by his family. And what I want to show you is in Genesis chapter 45, there's an incredible confrontation and encounter that takes place. It's now been about, I think, 22 or 23 years after his brothers have wronged him. Now this famine is taking place and people all over the world are showing up at his door for food. And you know who shows up? The very people who hurt him, who betrayed him, who wronged him. Who not only were, did a wrongful act in throwing him in the pit and selling him, but now produced Years of like literally, literally 13 years of heartache. Like the dreams that God had given them seemed to have been literally shattered. And now all of a sudden, these guys that have wronged him and produced these years of, of hurt and battle, Joseph's face to face with them. And in that moment, we're going to see, I think, how. And probably one of the closest pictures of what forgiveness looks like. See, we all know that we should forgive, right? Yeah. We know that that's what the Bible says. The Bible says in Ephesians 4.32 that we're supposed to forgive just as we have been forgiven in Christ Jesus. The Bible talks about that. In the Lord's Prayer, it tells us, forgive us our debts as we forgive those who trespass against us and leave us not to do it. And it talks about how we're to forgive as we're forgiven. Matthew 18 talks about we're supposed to forgive people of what they've done against us because it compares nothing to how great we've been forgiven. So we forgive because we've been forgiven. We know that that's happened, but nowhere in scriptures does it really tell you how do you forgive? It's just like, you know, the spirit, the, uh, the model for Nike. It's just, just do it. It's like yeah. forgiveness is this spiritual gift that we're just told, just, just do it. But my question was this, how do you do it? How do you forgive? Because I tried. I would say the words, but then the next day, the feelings would be there. I would forgive again. And then all of a sudden, I would something else would happen, and it would remind me of it again. <clears throat> and then all of a sudden, you know what? I'm struggling again, and I'm feeling stuck, and I feel like I'm drowning. And then I feel like a failure, like something's wrong with me. Because why am I not able to forgive when I know I'm supposed to forgive? I say I forgive, but then here I am, and I don't know if I forgive. And so Matthew 45, it was just something that was just so empowerful. So let me read you this. This is, again, Joseph 
coming face to face with his brothers. To me, I think you can look at this passage in two lights. One, I think it's a great test to let you know if you've forgiven someone. But I also think it provides an insight in what I think forgiveness towards the people in your life, what it needs to look like, or how do you actually begin to go about doing it. And so every one of these kind of points, I'm going to throw them out to you. One of the things God's doing in my life is, is we're transitioning from pastoral ministry and we're creating this to become our full-time ministry is we're so passionate about helping people forgive. I've talked with pastors. I've talked with drug dealers, gang members, victims of violent crimes, people who have had marriages, you know, a spouse wound them and hurt them. I've talked to teenagers who just struggle with relationship with their parents because they don't feel their parents value their words or care for it or give them value. It's just, there's always these conflicts. And I've spent hours of hours and hundreds of hours just talking with people. And so I found that, man, if we don't fix this in the body of Christ, then you know what? We're going to continue to see the light that is supposed to shine bright in our community and our nation continuously to grow dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. So let me give you Genesis 45. Here's what it says. It says, Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all of his intents, and he cried out, Have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. So this is there's where they're coming face to face. He says, And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him, and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. They thought Joseph now was going to, it was going to have payback. Payback was going to take place. And then it goes on and says, And Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. And when they had done so, he said, I am your brother, Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now don't be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now there has been a famine in the land, and for the next five years there will be no plowing and reaping, but God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by great deliverance. So then, it was not you who sent me here, but God. Everyone say, but God. But God. Come on, do it a little better. Say, but God. But God. But God. like a half mile between you and me, so I can't quite hear it, so I got delayed. He says, but God. He said, he made me father to Pharaoh. Lord of his entire household and ruler of all, all Egypt. <laughs> it says, now hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, don't delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen. Be near me. You, your children and grandchildren, your flocks and herds and all you have, I will provide for you there because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household and all who belong to you will become destitute. <laughs> so my question is this. When I read this passion, this passage, for those in this place, and what I want you to specifically think about right now is this. If you're struggling to forgive someone, someone's hurt you, it could have happened 20 years ago, it could have happened 12 years ago like me, it could have happened 30 years ago. But you know there's a name, there's a face, there's a story, there's an incident, there's an action, there's there's also then the impact, the wake of what has happened even because of those actions. And you know that when you think about it, you know if there's someone you need to forgive. If they walk in the room, you ain't looking to go give them a hug or a handshake. You're kind of like, okay, cold shoulder, let me just act like I don't see them over there. <laughs> Happens in our churches, you know, it's like, good morning, good morning. And you see them coming out of the car and then conveniently you leave your door greeting post to go get a coffee so you don't have to greet them. You know, we all have those moments, don't we? But here's what Joseph did. I'm going to give you five little practical take-homes of how you can actually begin fighting your fight to forgive. Or if you want to put it up against a test, how do you know if you're still, if you have forgiven? The first thing I put up this, as I say this, if you want to win your fight to forgive, you've got to clear the room. Clear the room. Let me explain this. The very first thing Joseph did in this passage, it says this. He says, he cried out, have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. He cleared the room. Why do we clear the room? 
Because here it is, in your environment will determine the outcome and people in your room will create or hinder a forgiveness environment. How many know that that is true? In other words, this, I know that for me, if I had people that just wanted to throw a pity party with me and they wanted to come and go, oh, I feel your pain, I feel your pain, how many know that's not going to help me get better? There's also people, I think, are gas throwers. They're going to come in there, that's wrong. You know what? They should have done this. You could, they should have done this. They, that's not right. That's, that's, that's not fair. That's not, and you know, so you got people that will throw fuel on your fire. And if you have those people around you, yes, they got your back. Yeah, they're your bro or your sister or their family. And family sticks closer to God. But I'm going to tell you, it's not going to help you win your fight to forgive. They're just putting fuel on a fire that God wants to put out so he can now create a new fire, and that's with him. I think there's also those friends that are just, they become the, the dumpsters that you can just go to and just dump. And you just dump on them. And you just want to, you can go to them and say, this is what happened. And they just absorb it all in like a sponge. And you think that they're being the greatest friend because they're just the listeners. And I'm just going to tell you, if you struggle to forgive, you're going to have to clear your room and get some people out of your room so that you can put some new people into your room to help you win that fight. So for me, why do you clear the room? I think this, you've got to get some of those people out, but you also need a corner in your room. You need people that will walk with you during those toughest times, don't you? And so you need someone in your life. For some who've experienced trauma like me, you might have to go see a counselor. A, a, and I recommend a Christian counselor. You might need a counselor or a pastor or a coach or a mentor. Someone outside that has that outer perspective that can speak truth into your situation. But you will need people in your life like that. You're going to need someone who will help you. Like every boxer, you know what they have? They have a manager. They have a, a kind of their guy in their corner who's like their manager. They're their coach. But then there's also a cut doctor. Because when life knocks you up, sometimes you get cut, sometimes you get wounded. And you're going to need some people in your life that can help treat those wounds. And how do you treat those wounds? You're going to need people that will pray with you, who will put God's word upon the wound, and to treat it with reminding you of God's promises, but not just in, you know, just always like, hey, you got to do this, and you, you know, that's wrong. You need the right kind of people in your corner. Because again, your environment will determine the outcome and the people in your room will create or hinder that environment that you need to win your fight to forgive. The second reason you clear the room is this. It's because we need to, we're supposed to, what I learned from Joseph is, is we protect and cover when presented with opportunities to expose and hurt. In other words, Joseph had a great opportunity to hurt his brothers and expose what they did after so many years and you know what would have happened? If he would have done that, his family, most of his brothers, they probably would have been killed. Because now Joseph, the second leading person in the nation, he has his servants and his attendants. Which one is not going to want to prove their loyalty to Joseph? And when they said, you did this to, to my boss, to, to the second leading, I'll take care of this. But what happens is this. When someone's hurt you, the temptation is going to hurt them. Hurt people what? Hurt people. But people who have been forgiven and forgive, you will protect and cover when presented with an opportunity to expose and hurt. How do you know if you've forgiven? Do you keep talking about to other people, totally unrelated to what has transpired? And in doing so, you harm their reputation. You're just sharing your side. You might think that you're just kind of processing but are you exposing and hurting their reputation, their character? It's a great way to know if you've won that fight. So clear the room. It's the first thing Joseph did. The second thing he does this. I put down this. You see beyond. See, for Joseph, what I think is amazing, he hasn't seen these brothers who've hurt him for so, he did all of this pain, and they hurt him for so long. The first thing he says to him, he says this. I'm Joseph. Is my father still living? For, for me, it's the they still need you moment. Joseph realized that in the moment, you can choose to do one thing. You can put all of your attention on the people and what they did to you, or you can put all of your attention on the impact it's had on you, or you can see beyond both 
and find out and recognize who needs you to overcome this battle. Who needs you to keep fighting for tomorrow and fighting to forgive? Because again, the people they need you, the person you will become will largely depend on what choices you make in those moments. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. So you see beyond. You notice those that need you more than those that hurt you. That's such a key. The third thing I put down is this. You don't let them be afraid of you. <laughs> we want to use, we're really good when people hurt us, to use fear as a weapon. We want them to be intimidated. We want them when they walk into our presence, we want them to kind of shudder like, oh, we want them to feel that guilt or that shame or afraid. But Joseph does none of that. Matter of fact, he does just the opposite. He says, don't be afraid. Three times he says, don't be afraid. Come close to me. Don't be distressed. Don't fear me. He brings them close. For me and my journey, my don't let them be afraid of you moment came when after everything was done with the trials and the court proceedings, one day I wrote my attacker a letter. And now, nine years later, we write almost monthly. Matter of fact, in the next couple months, we're praying and discussion, talking about me actually going to visit him in prison face to face. And the reason I wrote him that letter is this. I wanted him to not be afraid of me. I didn't want him to be wrapped up in shame and guilt his whole life. My prayer is this, that God would get a hold of his heart. God would show him that he's not done with them. And yes, he's made some really bad mistakes. And yes, he, he's happened to pay the price. And there's consequences for his action. But I'm not the one that's sitting here going, yes, consequence, consequence. He needs to feel it. He needs to feel it. I don't want him to be afraid of me. Oftentimes, when you study scriptures, those who are forgiven, you're going to find this. They end up serving the very people who hurt them. Isn't that counterculture? That you serve those? Instead of distancing, now listen, don't get me wrong. There's moments when there needs to be healthy boundaries put up because there's been a violation. And there's sometimes, especially when there's been abuse and trauma, I'm not saying you just blindly go into that, so don't take that. But I'm just going to say this. Oftentimes you'll find those who have hurt you maybe wrong, you lied, betrayed, some of those type of things, you'll find that sometimes God will lead you right back to them. And not to make them afraid, but he's going to say, bring them up close to you because he's going to use you in their lives. The last thing, the fourth thing, you don't let them feel guilty. You don't let them feel guilty. He says, so then it was not you who sent me, but God. He made me father over Pharaoh and Lord of this entire. He says, it's not you sent me. He said, don't be distressed. In other words, don't blame yourself. God put me here for a reason. For me, whenever there's been injustices done in the, just, the justice system, there's three different levels. There's the perpetrator, the victim, and then there's society. The perpetrator, the ones who do the wrong in the justice system, they will have punishment. The victim, they basically in the scope of justice, they are validated. And what they get for the victim, it's called the victim's impact statement. Because justice for me, this man who did this to me, there's no way, there's no form of justice that he can do. He can't take back what he already did. I have four feet of scars all over my body. There's nothing he can do to take back all 37 stabs that he stabbed me with. There's nothing. He can't take back the impact it's had on my kids, my finances, my life. He can't do it. There's no justice to take that back. So what a victim does is they get this victim impact statement. Why? So that everyone could validate you as you were right in that you were wrong, you're the victim. And then justice is for the society to make sure society is protected. And so the state acts on behalf to say, well, here's your punishment, and it's based on making sure society is kept safe. That's justice. But for the victim, when you've been wrong, <laughs> you've been wrong. There's nothing that they can undo. It's, it's happened. But what happens is oftentimes what we get is this validation that we're a victim. So for me, when it came down to giving a victim statement, and for me, I knew that at that moment, I could choose this. I could, I could give a victim statement and need validation, 
But I didn't need to be validated as a victim because I had the scars of my body to prove that I was a victim. What I chose to do is instead of just having the perpetrator, the victim in society, I introduced a fourth person into the process, and that is God. And it is with you and I, it happens all the time when someone wrongs you. There's the perpetrator, the offender, there's the offended, the victim, you and I. And then there's the society piece, but that society might be your family, the impact it has on your family, your church, your community. But I'm going to challenge you, how do you forgive? It's when you can begin to, in, in, in the middle of all of that, introduce a fourth person. And what Joseph time and time again says, but God, but God. You didn't do this, but God put 